I'm sure you've all seen the mesmerizing videos of 3D prints growing layer by layer like this. In this video, I want to show you how to set up my 3D printers to do layer lapses using a smartphone or a DSLR camera without having to modify the printer firmware or use Octoprint. So first of all, how is this effect actually achieved? Well, it's just like a time lapse, except rather than taking pictures at set time intervals, pictures are taken after each layer of the print is completed, when the bed and extruder are in the same position. As pictures are taken after each layer, rather than at set time intervals, I prefer to refer to these as a layer lapse or print lapse. So I need to find a way to get the camera to take a picture after each layer was printed. I started off doing some research and found a lot of people using Octoprint or modifying the printer firmware to externally trigger a camera. At the time, I didn't have a camera, so I wanted to use my smartphone and thought there must be an easier way to do it. So I did some more research and found a few things similar to what I wanted. The solution was to add an extra limit switch on the end of the x-axis to act as an external trigger for my phone, and then to insert some custom G-code to make the print head press the switch after each layer is printed. Both Slicer and Cura have really easy ways to do this, which I'll show you in a minute, and I believe some other slicers have the same features as well. Most camera apps for Android smartphones can be triggered to take a picture by pressing the volume keys. This also applies to the volume keys on a headset. This basically works by changing the resistance across the microphone, which the phone can detect. I've included links in the description to the Android 3.5mm jack specification if you're interested in the technical details, although you don't need to know them for this. I actually found it's cheaper to buy a headset than just the required 3.5mm 4-pole jack I would need, and it also meant I wouldn't need to add my own resistor. I simply removed the volume up button and soldered wires going to the limit switch to it instead, so pressing the limit switch acts as the volume up button. Now, you might be thinking, but Isaac, I don't have a headphone jack. Well, never fear, there's an elegant solution. All you need is an elastic band, limit switch and some tape, a coin and your charging cable. You'll need to tape one end of the wire to the coin, put the elastic band around the phone and plug in the charger. Then position the coin on the screen where the camera shutter button is and use the elastic band to hold it in place. The last thing to do is to connect the other wire from the limit switch to the phone's ground which is why you need the charging cable. Just hook the wire around the exposed ground connection, then whenever the switch is pressed, the coin will be grounded and a capacitive touchscreen will read this as a touch. Most DSLR cameras can have an external trigger attached and often use a 2.5mm 3-pole jack for this. You can control the focus or shutter depending on which ring of the jack you short to ground. As the shuttering only needs to be shorted to ground, the limit switch can be connected between them without any additional resistors or circuitry. I designed two different brackets to mount a limit switch to both my ANET A8 and my Ender 3 3D printers. Links for both the designs will be in the description box. The bracket for the ANET A8 mounts a limit switch to the 8mm rod of the X-axis. The Ender 3 bracket uses a T-nut to attach to the V-slot aluminium extrusion of the X-axis. Both of the brackets are positioned at the end of the print head's range of motion, so it doesn't restrict the printable area. We'll need to know exactly how far along the X-axis the limit switch is, so we can make the print head press it. The easiest way to do this is to home the printer, then jog the X-axis until it's near the switch, and note the value. Then jog it a bit further until it actually presses the switch, and remember that value too. I also jogged the y-axis forward to a position where I thought it would be best to take the pictures of the print. We'll need to use this value later too. To get a good looking layer lapse, all the images need to look as similar as possible. So all the camera settings need to be manual so they don't automatically change during the print. I've downloaded the Open Camera app on Android because it gives me the options to lock the white balance, exposure and focus. Also it has an option to keep the screen on so the phone doesn't go to sleep during the print. I designed and 3D printed a bracket to attach a flexible phone holder to the aluminium extrusion of my Ender 3. This allows the phone to be positioned at a good angle to capture the print and not interfere with the printer. Ideally, you want as good a lighting setup as possible to get consistent and good pictures. I've been using a lamp positioned over the print bed and got the results you see in this video. Before starting a print, the focus needs to be set where the printed part will actually appear. I found the easiest way to do this was to move the bed to the y-axis position I told you to remember earlier, in my case 150mm, then place an object in the centre of the bed and focus on it, then lock the exposure and white balance too. On my first attempt, I set the focus on the bed, but this meant only the bottom of the print was in focus, and as the layers were added and got higher, they went out of focus. Hence why I now put an object of a similar size to what I'll be printing on the bed to focus on. I would also suggest plugging in your phone to charge while taking a print lapse, as they can last hours and you don't want your battery to die halfway through. Now I just need to put the G-code on the SD card.
Now the printer and camera are set up, we just need something to print. So it's time to open up Cura, import a model, and set all the slicing settings for it. We need to make the print head press the switch between every layer. This can be done by adding some post-processing scripts. I'm using Cura version 4.4, which has these plugins already included. I believe you can manually add them to older versions too though. Now you'd probably be tempted to use the insert on layer change script, but don't. It does work, but causes a really bad oozing issue. This is because after it executes the inserted g-code to press the switch, it primes the extruder, effectively meaning it has zero attraction from the distance between the switch back to the start of the next layer, causing a lot of oozing. I fixed the issue by using two search and replace scripts instead. Here's the first script. I search and replace semicolon, mesh, colon, non-mesh, as this occurs prior to each layer change. Anything on a line after a semicolon is just a comment and not part of the g-code that gets executed by the printer. So the first command is g91, which sets the printer into relative positioning mode. So on the next line, it will be able to attract 6.5mm without needing to know the absolute extrusion value. G1 is a linear move in which all of the axes arrive at destination at the same time. Here it's just used to retract the filament the 6.5mm, the feed rate of 3000. Next, G90 sets the printer back to absolute coordinate mode, so it can move the print head to the switch, which is at a known position. G0 moves the axes to a target position at the feed rate, but does not necessarily move in a straight line or have all the axes arrive at the same time. Next, the print head moves to press the switch. The G4 P10 command causes a 10 millisecond delay. The switch is then released and pauses for another 800 milliseconds to give the camera time to capture a picture. The second script searches for G0F300 and replaces it with G0F9000. This is necessary because otherwise the entire movement back from the switch to the start of the next layer would occur at a feed rate of 300, which is very slow and causes more oozing. This feed rate might be specific to my printer and the Cura settings I'm using, but I haven't been able to find a way to change it yet, so I had to go with this solution. This may mean it's a different value for you, so check your G-code and make sure it matches the search and replace scripts. Slicer has an insert on layer change post-processing script, but that actually works because it generates the movement order slightly differently and doesn't set the extruder distance until after it's back in place over the print. Now, back over to Cura because I want to change the start G-code to get a picture of the clean bed before the first layer is printed. And I also need to take a picture of the completed print as I realise the search and replace misses the last layer so I need to modify the end G-code. In the start G-code, after the G28 homing command, I just add the same G-code that's inserted by the search and replace, except I raise the extruder slightly first so it doesn't scrape across the bed. In the end G-code, I literally just add the same G-code that gets inserted every layer. We have everything set up, so now it's time to save it to an SD card and print it. I'll admit this isn't the best printer I've done, and it had a lot of stringing, but as you can see, the layer laps worked perfectly. So after the print is finished, you have hundreds of pictures on your phone, which now need to be edited into the layer laps. There are probably a million different bits of software and ways to do this, but here's how I do it. First, transfer all the pictures into a directory on a computer. Then open HitFilm, which is a free video editing software. All you have to do is start a new project with your desired resolution and frame rate. Then click the arrow next to the import button and select image sequence. Select the folder containing all your pictures and they will be imported as a video clip. Drop it on the timeline and then you can edit it how you want or just export it and it's all done. I generally like to do some colour correction, then keyframe in a bit of movement to make it a bit more dynamic and interesting to watch. Once I'm happy with the tool, I export it and give it an incredibly creative name. Now it's finished exporting, we can look at the results. And here's another bonus layer lapse for you to enjoy. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, leave a comment down below. If you found the video helpful, leave a like and consider subscribing.